Trisha, sing this out, you know it. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I try to hide It was my turn Till I met you Come on, you called my name You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into Your mercy has saved my soul. Come on, now your freedom is all I know. Now your freedom is all that I know. Come on, we sing the old name new. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name. You called my name. Shout it out. Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day about you church but I need rescue because my sin is heavy so I'm gonna take it to the king the risen king come on let's sing this out together I needed rescue my sin was heavy but change break at the window I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me citizen of heaven when I was broken you are my healer now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name Come on, shout it out, Trent. Give him a shout of praise in this place. All right, church, now done praise me. Now go ahead and put those hands together.
prepare the way. Come on, let's lift this up together as a church. Prepare the way. Prepare the way. church. Give Jesus a shout of praise in this place. We're here celebrating Good Friday. And that might seem like a weird thing to celebrate to a lot of people who don't believe what we believe because the world would look on and say, hey, isn't this day about the death of your Messiah? And yet for those of us who recognize the power of death, because Christ's death is what conquered death. It's what conquered sin. It's what conquered the grave. And I want to let you know tonight, we serve a lion. But what makes our lion so powerful, the lion of the tribe of Judah, is that our lion became a lamb. And that lamb was sacrificed. That lamb was put to death because of you and me, because of our sin because of our trespasses. But as we come to the foot of the cross to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, I'm reminded of the last roar that that lion took on the cross when he said to Telestai, it is finished. You know what's finished? Finished is the hold that sin and death has upon your life. Finished is you living a life alone, pursuing your own desires. Finish is you living a life of shame, a life of dependency upon what the world has to offer you, and you become a new creation in Jesus Christ. Is anyone thankful for that? Stand up. We're going to sing Hail, Hail, Lion of Judah one more time. And as we do, I want to remind you of a verse in John chapter 11, verse 20, 20, verse 25. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So church, I ask you what Jesus asked. Do you believe this? Come on, do you believe that truth, church? Let's sing it, come on.
you for those final words that you declared, it is finished. The purpose for which you came, the penalty that you paid, the debt that we owed, Lord, finished is the grip of death, of sin upon us. And all those who call upon the name of Jesus will be saved. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. You can have a seat. How good is it being here on a Friday night, worshiping so Jesus? Look, the, the whole world is out on a Friday night. They're partying. They're out going to clubs. They're drinking. Something I've heard my dad said for years, they're drinking to forget. Tonight we drink to remember right. what Jesus Christ accomplished yeah. for us. And on that note, we are going to be taking communion a little later in service after Pastor Skip shares this message. Hopefully you received your communion packet on your way in. But if you did not, we've got a team that's going to hand them out to you right now. So just slip your hand in the air while we're giving these few announcements. And as you slip your hand in the air, we're going to have a team member bring a communion packet to you. Hey, it is so good to be in the house tonight. I don't know about you, but there's just something about worshiping the Lord in this place yeah. on a Friday night. Good Friday. Right. It's a glorious day to be here. Um, hey, we recognize a lot of people might be here for the first time. You might have been invited by a friend. Church, can we make some noise for all the first timers who are in the house with us tonight? If it is your first time, we have these little red cards. They say next steps. If you fill one of these cards out and come bring it to one of our team members, we yeah. should have, I think, uh, a spot out in the our foyer where there. they can. The gazebo's not up, but the team is there. And so you can find a pastor That's right. or a team member and we'll get a gift to you. We'll get a gift to you as well. We want to make a donation in your honor to one of four incredible charities doing work around the world. Hey, I'm curious. How many of you are planning on joining us for Easter sunrise at UNM Stadium? going to be absolutely incredible. We're so, so excited to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior at 7.30 a.m. I want to encourage you, we have a good 36 hours before that service happens. Utilize that time to bring somebody with you. Make sure that, you know, we've got a team right now setting up, you know, speakers and a stage. They're there missing out on tonight so that we can share the gospel with people on Sunday morning. Make sure that you put in some work tomorrow to bring somebody with you. And then, of course, we've got a 9 and 11 a.m. service here on the Osuna campus as well. And then an egg hunt for all the kids at 1 p.m. on Easter Sunday. Just a little earlier, we were with some friends, and I was reminded we've been doing this service since the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And in that time, we've seen tens of thousands of people yeah. say yes to Jesus at the Easter sunrise service. That's worth giving God a shout of praise, right? People yeah. that are going to heaven yeah. experience resurrection power in their lives. We have something special for you this weekend. You should have gotten it as you came in. We have these little uh, blank square cards. It's a little paper card. And you might wonder what this is. Well, this isn't just any paper. Um, this is a special paper. It has seeds, wildflower seeds inside the paper. And when you plant this in the ground, it will actually grow wildflowers. And our theme this year is into the ground for Good Friday. And then Easter is from the ground. Jesus Christ was laid into the ground in the tomb. But three days later, he rose from the dead and he defeated death and the grave. And so what we want you to do is you can do this during service or you can do it at home. Write down something in your life that this year you're committing to put to death. You're committing to put into the ground, believing and trusting that God is going to breathe new life yes. into your soul through that. Uh, we like to say that in order for a seed to blossom and become a flower, the seed has to die. Yeah. And out of the seed comes a flower. So we encourage you, put your seeds into the ground and then pray and commit this year to watching God turn those ashes uh, into beauty. So good. And with that mindset, we do have a video to set up the teaching. Let's turn our attention to the screens. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life till you return to the ground. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return.
He went a little farther and fell on the ground. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, Well, welcome to our Good Friday service. I'm glad that you came this evening. Party. Was that a cue for me to dance? Because that's not a pretty picture if I do that. Um, we've already had a service today at noon, and our, our team told me that it was the largest service they can remember ever on this campus for Good Friday. You know, we have, we meet outside usually. And we did today, we meet in the amphitheater, but then we have overflow for other people who want to come out in the green belt. You know, usually the amphitheater's overflow for what happens here, but because we were out there, we needed overflow for that, and so even that was full. So we've had a good Friday, but uh, it's better now that you're here, and we're glad that we can have a, an evening service. So turn in your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. I grew up seeing one of these in my church every single week. I'm seeing people nod, so I'm guessing this is a pretty common sight in uh, uh, many of the churches. So this was up at the front. It was much bigger in my church in California. It was like life-size. And I walked in every Sunday morning, and I saw that crucifix. And I, it always made me a little sad because I realized what Jesus went through and the pain that he went through. And, and every time I went in, I was, like everybody else, focused on, drawn to, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But I think I misunderstood what the cross really was all about, because though I was raised in a church, and I looked at this week by week, I didn't really give my life to Christ until much later in life. Yes, I was religious, like some of you are religious but uh, I never really had a relationship with Jesus personally until I was 18 years of age and it became real to me. It became, it became something that wasn't a, a myth or a legend or he wasn't a figurehead. He was real. He was risen from the dead and he could help me and I called upon his name and life changed for me. And uh, just as we are getting prepared to take communion uh, I want some of you to be prepared by the end of this time together to give your lives to Jesus Christ. Some of you have been putting that off for way too long. And Good Friday will be the best Friday ever if you let the Savior invade your life in a real and a meaningful way. But I think a lot of people do misunderstand the meaning of the cross. I heard a story about a soldier in wartime who jumped into a foxhole and he was dodging bullets obviously he kept digging with his hands in the foxhole to deepen it for more protection and finally he dug so deep that he felt a crucifix he picked it up out of the dirt and noticed it was a crucifix like what I held up but it was metal it had been left obviously by a previous occupant of the foxhole and he just stared at it until two soldiers jumped into the foxhole as well, and along with them, an army chaplain. And the man, the soldier in the foxhole who had the crucifix, held it up and said to the chaplain, boy, am I glad to see you. How do you work one of these things anyway? <laughs> I think a lot of people have a misunderstanding of what, what the cross is all about and the purpose and the meaning of the crucifixion. Some people look at the cross and they think that it was a tragic mistake. Jesus got himself killed. Other people think that it was a miscarriage of Roman justice. But most people, when they look at a cross, they just see a symbol. It's probably the most recognizable religious symbol in all the world. And it sets to them 
Christianity apart from other belief systems because we believe in the one who died on that cross. They just see it as a symbol. And it's a symbol that adorns buildings. It is a symbol that is made into jewelry. It's a symbol that is tattooed on people's bodies. And uh, even around this time, you can go to the store and buy chocolate crosses. Boy, have people gotten so far away from the meaning of the cross. Now, if you have a piece of jewelry that's a cross, that's fine. I'm not getting down on that. But I'm saying this. The early church never would have thought about wearing a cross. That would be like you and me wearing a little gas chamber around our neck or a hangman's noose. It was an implement of capital punishment. And to a Jewish person, the cross was a symbol of the utmost shame possible. Because in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 21, the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And what does that mean? It means that the Jews, when they would exercise capital punishment, they stoned people to death. They didn't crucify them. They didn't hang them. But if it was an exceptionally bad person, criminal, sometimes after the person died, they would put that body up on the tree to warn people as a deterrent not to commit that kind of sin or that kind of crime. Now, when it came to the Messiah, and that's what we are celebrating, the, the death of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Messiah, our Lord, the idea of death for the Messiah was an absolutely foreign idea. The Jews had a conquest culture. They believed that the Messiah will be a conqueror. He's going to have conquest over the Romans or over their oppressors, over their enemies. In their minds, they did not even think possible that the coming Messiah would suffer, let alone suffer such an ignominious, horrible, tragic death as that of crucifixion. So they had a conquest culture, but Jesus clearly came to bring a different culture than that. Let's call it a cross culture. A culture of the cross. Yes, Jesus is going to come and conquer. Yes, he's going to come and rule and reign. Yes, he's going to eventually come and set up his kingdom. But first, he came to be the sin bearer, to deal with our biggest problem, the disease of all men and all women, and that is the disease of sin. Now, this culture that I'm talking about is the culture of the New Testament. The New Testament is a cross culture. It is a culture that pervades the entire early church. It pervades everything. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. He also wrote in Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid that I should boast or glory in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. So we, we, don't, just, we don't just commemorate his death. We boast in it. We brag about it. We are saved because of it. It is the foundation of our boasting. Again, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I have determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So throughout the whole New Testament, it centers on this event, the cross, Calvary. When people come to Christ, and we put them in the water. What do we call that outside? Baptism. Do you know that baptism is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection? We're having people identify with the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and then risen again. That's the symbolism of going down into the water. And so we put people down into the water. And if they were, like, really bad in their past life, we keep them down a long time. <laughs> but we bring them back up eventually. Like, after a minute or two, we... We let them go. No, we don't do that. We don't torture them. But we are, simply, we are simply commemorating with them in this personal expression of death, burial, and resurrection. In a few moments, we're going to take communion. 
And what we are doing is making a proclamation of death. That's what Paul said. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then the name of this church is what? Calvary. Calvary. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's where Jesus died. You know what Calvary means? It's from Calvarium in the Latin, Golgotha uh, in the uh, old language, and that is the place of the skull. You know, it's funny, uh, somebody sometimes will go over to Solomon's Porch, our coffee shop next door, and they'll see the symbol on Sopo, and it's a skull. And they'll get offended by that. It's like they, they see a skull. And somebody came in recently and said uh, to uh, our, our staff, what are you guys celebrating death? And here's the right answer. As a matter of fact, we are. Didn't you know the name of this church is Calvary? Don't you know we are celebrating the death of our Savior? Why are we celebrating it? Because it's by his death that we have life. That's why. It makes all the difference in the world. This is why churches must never eliminate the cross from their vocabulary or their worship. And there's a tendency to do that. More and more churches are embarrassed about the blood. It used to be that you go to church and you would sing songs like, There's power in the blood, or there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. But now that's terminology that's, to some, archaic, outdated, offensive. Nobody wants to talk about death and the blood unless that's the only way you can get to heaven. And it is, and if it is, that we want to boast about that. We don't want to give up talking about the blood. We need to remember what it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. By his stripes we are healed. Now, in John chapter 12, and we looked at that passage last Sunday, and we're going to look at it again Easter, but though different verses, we remember in John chapter 12 that Jesus has just entered Jerusalem from the east. He has come from the Mount of Olives. He has come down the Mount of Olives. He has entered into the city of Jerusalem to the praises and the hosannas of the crowd. But once he's in the city... He starts speaking about his impending death, and he gets very personal. In John chapter 12, verse 27, Jesus speaking, he said, Now, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. There's a few things I want to note here. First of all, the pain of the cross. Notice that Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. It means agitated. Uh, it means stirred up. It's the same exact word in John chapter 5, when the pool of Bethesda was stirred up, the waters moved, they were agitated. It's a word that describes being emotionally and spiritually disturbed. Jesus is saying, I'm upset. There's something that is bothersome to me. Now you say, well, what would be bothering Jesus at this moment? Oh, I don't know. He knows he's going to die in a few days. That would be enough, don't you think? He knows the kind of death he is going to die. Can you imagine living your whole life knowing how you're going to die and when? He says, now my soul is troubled. Maybe he's just looking head ahead a little bit and thinking of the whip that's going to be plunged into his back by the Roman lictors or the crown of thorns that will be pushed on his brow or the spikes that will go through the nerves in his wrist and that slow, painful death of Roman crucifixion. But more than that, his soul was troubled because 
when he is up on that cross, as excruciating, as painful as that is, something far worse would happen. All the sins ever committed will be poured onto him. All the sin of the world will be dumped on him. You know what made it worse? That it was dumped on him and no one else? He was the only person who ever lived that was sinless. He never sinned once, nothing. All the sins of the world would be dumped on him. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. So it's interesting. Here is John writing a few days before the crucifixion. Jesus is emotionally troubled. What's interesting is John doesn't give the same kind of detail as the other gospel writers when it comes to Jesus going to the Garden of Gethsemane before his trial. John mentions it, but he does not go into the detail of the Garden of Gethsemane, but John does go into the detail of Jesus' emotional makeup. Now my soul is troubled, upset, bothered, agitated. The worst thing, I think, that caused the troubling in Jesus' heart far more than the pain, far more even than the sin being dumped on him, was the separation he would experience from the Father as a result of the sins being poured on him. Remember, he is God the Son. He walked in perfect, unique fellowship as the only begotten Son of the Father. And here he is speaking of God as the Father. Father, save me from this hour. But when he's on the cross, he will say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's all that about? That's the separation that caused, was caused by sin. So if you ever say, well, you know, my sin isn't that bad. Other people are worse. Your sin did that to him. My sin did that to him. And so the pain of the cross, my soul is troubled. A second thing I want you to note is the purpose of the cross. Because although Jesus says, now my soul is troubled, he then says, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. And here it is. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Jesus knew his mission all along. He knew why he had come. And he knows what is going to happen. And so he says to the Father, in effect, I'm not turning away from the cross. I'm leaning into it. I'm abandoning myself to it because this will glorify you. Father, glorify your name. That's courage. You know, real courage is not being unafraid of something. Real courage is, though you are afraid, doing the right thing anyway. And so, yes, my soul is troubled, but I'm not asking you to take it away right now. I am leaning into it, and I'm saying, Father, glorify your name. Why? Because this was his life's work, that's why. He realizes, this is why I'm here. This is what Christmas is all about. This is what Bethlehem is all about. Remember, they gave him, the wise men, gold, frankincense, and what? You know what myrrh is? Embalming fluid. Yeah, you've been around here a while. You know what that is. It's an odd gift, don't you think? Hey, Mary, so congratulations on your baby boy. Here's some embalming fluid. <laughs> what? Okay, myrrh had other qualities. It was a beautiful smelling thing, but it, principally it was used to embalm the dead, and I think it was prophetic of why he was born. For this reason, or for this purpose, he says here, I have come to this. I remember what it says in the book of Revelation. Jesus we just talked about him being the lamb and the lion. It calls him the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So you see, if Jesus didn't die, then Jesus couldn't be our substitute. If Jesus couldn't be our substitute, then we couldn't be forgiven. If we couldn't be forgiven, then we couldn't have salvation. If we couldn't have salvation, we couldn't have hope, and if we didn't have hope, we would have no future except an eternal hell. Now you know why Jesus said, no, don't save me from this hour. 
I came for this hour. This is my life's work. In fact, the writer of Hebrews takes it a step further and says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You know that verse, right? Don't you ever find that an odd verse? I, I do. I mean, I think, okay, um, saying, yes, Father, I resign myself to this, I submit myself to this, is one thing. But to say, I actually have joy going to the cross. You might think no one in their right mind could. Why could Jesus say, I have joy for the joy that was set before him? Because of you. You're the joy. Because by going to that cross, he could say, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. You know, we say hell is lost in another one. You know Jesus is going, yes, every time somebody says yes to him. That's the joy. He could save people. He could rescue people. Several years ago, I was, um, I was in a movie. I didn't, didn't know if you knew that I was a movie star. Um, I'm not. So um, it was a movie done by the Billy Graham Association. I got a call from the producer, uh, whom I knew. And he said, hey, uh, we're doing this movie, and it's called The Last Flight Out, and we want you to play Dr. Bob in the movie. You're going to be a medical doctor. I said, well, um, I have, I'm not an actor. I said, we, they said, we, we, we know you're not an actor. You're going to have very few lines. But at the end, we want you to stand up in the medical clinic, and we want you to preach the gospel. We don't want to have an actor share the gospel. We want somebody who actually believes the gospel to share the gospel. I said, okay, I'll, I'm your huckleberry. I'll do it. <laughs> so uh, I did it. And uh, during this film, uh, the, the lead actor and actress, they were not believers, but they were part of this. You know, they had their lines. And um, uh, the guy... Uh, was the lead male actor had been in Black Hawk Down. He was pretty well known. And uh, he had trouble with some of his lines because some of his lines included the blood of Jesus Christ. So every time he came around to saying his line, he'd like fumble and stumble and get choked up and didn't come out right. And finally he laid, he just put his hands down and he goes, what's the big deal about the blood of Jesus Christ? Can we just take that line out? So I'm on the set. So I just thought, okay, th this, is, this, is, this is now my moment. So uh, I stepped forward, and we had a very uh, interesting and lively conversation. I said, look, let me just put it to you this way. The blood of Jesus Christ is everything. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, there would be no message. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, without Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and taking the penalty in our place, there would be, there's no power, there's no message, and there'd be no movie. So you don't get a paycheck. <laughs> Bottom line. Finally, we'll close with this. There's the power of the cross. That's right, the power. There's two different effects of the cross that I want you to make note of here. Two completely opposite effects of the cross. Effect number one, condemnation. Effect number two, salvation. Let's see, just by hearing those words, I, I, I want over here. I want to be in this category, salvation, not condemnation. But look at what it says in verse 31. Jesus speaking, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Do you realize when the world put Jesus Christ on the cross, it was judging itself. It was signing its own death warrant. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul put it this way, The rulers of this world have not understood it, for if they had, they would never have crucified our glorious Lord. Pontius Pilate thought he was judging Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus came before Pontius Pilate and Pilate says, what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? Yeah, be very careful how you answer that, Pilate, because you think you're judging him now, but there's coming a day when you two will meet again, but the roles will be reversed. He'll be your judge. What will you do with Jesus who is called the Christ? I'll ask you that tonight. What will you do with Jesus? Well, I think he was a nice guy. Really, that's it? 
Well, he was a good man. Really, that's it? Well, a lot of people, you know, they kind of rally around him and they get positive feelings whenever they sing about him. Really, that's it? Or is he something for you personally? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? What shall I do with Jesus who's, who is called the Christ? So they put Jesus on the cross, but they were judging themselves by that. That's why Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Yes, there's coming a judgment, but at the cross they were making a stand. He goes on to say in verse 31, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who's the ruler of this world? Tell me. Satan. Satan. He's called the God of this age, the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. The ruler of the present age. The world system that hates God is called the world in the Bible. And so Jesus says, now the ruler of this world is cast out. What does he mean? The cross was the first casting out of Satan. It effectively took his power away so that Jesus can save anyone who just says, I believe, I trust. There's going to be another casting out. At the tribulation period, the book of Revelation shows that Satan will be uh, cast permanently out of heaven. Now, I know that confuses some of you. What do you mean, out of heaven? Isn't he out of heaven now? Well, he has, evidently, he has access to heaven because the Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren who accuses us before God day and night. So he can get in God's ear somehow, but in the tribulation period, he'll be cast out a second time. Then there's a third casting out. That's the end of the tribulation period where he's bound for a thousand years during the glorious millennial kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ on earth. And the fourth and final casting out is when he is cast into the lake of fire for eternity. And we're all going to sing, ding dong, the witch is dead. That's condemnation. The second, though, is salvation. Salvation. Verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to himself. John, in the next verse, says he was speaking about his death. This is important. This verse has been greatly misinterpreted by a number of Christians over the years. They say, yes, Jesus said, if I am lifted up, so let's lift him up in praise. Let's lift him higher. He wasn't speaking about being lifted up in praise. He was speaking about literally being lifted up off the ground in shame and dying on a cross. That's what he meant. How do I know that? Because in John chapter 3, he explained it to Nicodemus. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus said, I will draw people. I will save people. Question, what draws a person to Jesus? Answer, in a nutshell, forgiveness. What draws people to Jesus? The ability of Jesus to take away our sins, give you a fresh start, give you a do-over. Everything, man, eh, it's been a crummy week and month and year, and I just, I've been walking with, I wish I could have a do-over. You can. You can. To many people, the idea of a bloody cross and celebrating and commemorating just seems so repulsive and it drives certain people away. But just like, just like that serpent in the wilderness, and Moses said, hey, you guys, you're all dying from these snake bites. Just look at that pole and the serpent on the pole. Somebody could have said, well, that's highly illogical. How could an actual, just a look at an object actually change? Well, just try it. And that's the thing. It worked. And in looking at the pole, they had to admit a couple things. I'm a sinner, and my sin is causing death, because everybody around me is dying, and I have to believe that a, just a look, the look of faith will save me from that snake bite. That's, what it, that's how it is with Jesus. When you come to Jesus, you admit you've fallen short, but you also believe by faith that what he did for you is enough. 
Quick question, and we're going to close. Quick question. Jesus died on a cross, right? Do you know who was supposed to be on that cross? Barabbas. You know who Barabbas was? Notorious criminal, insurrectionist, horrible guy, capital, worthy of capital punishment. He fully expected when he woke up that day, I'm going to be marched out to that Golgotha and they're going to kill me. I'm going to be on that center cross. Because he was the big fish that they wanted in the middle. But the people cried out, crucify Jesus, release Barabbas. So Barabbas is out on the street and he's going, and I'm sure everybody's like looking at him going, Duh, back up, stay away from that guy. But you got to know that Barabbas knew that Jesus Christ literally was dying for him. He was a substitute for him. He was dying in his place. He should be on that cross, but he wasn't. He's free. He has liberty. He has freedom. He can go home. He can see his buddies. He can do whatever he wants. Barabbas was the first person that Jesus died as a substitute for. Now, you and I, we're Barabbas. He was the first one. We're in a long line of people that Jesus has stood as a substitute for, was crucified as a substitute. He died for your sins. He died. All the wrath of God was poured on Jesus so it wouldn't be poured on you. And so on this Good Friday, if you want to make Good Friday a better Friday, the best Friday, say yes to Jesus. Now, we're going to take communion here in a moment. But if you don't know Jesus personally, if this is just sort of like a yearly religious gig that you do, I would advise against taking communion until you surrender your life to Christ. So what does that mean? Do I, do I have to make a pilgrimage somewhere and get on my knees? And No, you just got to believe. You just got to ask him in. You say, well, that's just too easy. Well, not for him. For you, yes. For him, very painful, very hard. He did the heavy lifting so you wouldn't have to. How's that for love? He just says, believe in me, trust in me. Give your heart to me. Watch me change you. You want a do-over? I'll give you a do-over. Let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for this Friday that we gather together and we commemorate a very brutal, what would seem like a brutal murder. But it wasn't. Yes, the Romans, the Jews, the people of the land were complicit in that and not guiltless. But it wasn't the Jews who put Jesus on the cross. It wasn't the Romans who put Jesus on the cross. It was our sins that put him on the cross. Really, it was his love that put him on the cross. Because he even said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. And so Jesus freely gave his life so that anyone who would look to him by faith, like looking in the Old Testament days at that bronze serpent, just looking by faith, believing by faith, trusting by faith, would be saved. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Some of you who are here, never done that personally. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. You've been invited by a friend. I want to give you an opportunity. If you have never personally given your life to Jesus Christ, or if you remember something in your past, some religious experience you've had, but you've walked away from that, it's something you remember 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago or more, and it's not a daily reality where you're walking with God, and you know it. You know it. And come back to Him. Come back home. Come back home. It's going to feel really good, but more than that, it's going to be really good. You say, well, I don't know if it'll work. Well, you'll never know till you try, will you? Take Jesus up at his word. You've got, you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. 
So if you're willing to surrender your life to Christ or to return to Him, maybe you've backslidden and you need to come back to Him. It needs to be real this time. I want you, as our heads are bowed, I want you to just raise your hand up in the air. Raising your hand, you're saying, Skip, pray for me. Pray for me, because I'm going to give my life to Jesus right here at this Good Friday service. So if you're here and you want to do that, raise your hand up. Keep it up for just a moment. God bless you and you and you and you. Right up in the front, in the middle, toward the back. A couple of you right here. Yes, right over here to my left. Anyone else? Way in the back. Yeah, awesome. Anyone else? You're in the balcony? I think I can see that far. Awesome. God bless you. Family room, anyone? Father, we do pray for every hand that was raised, every person behind that hand, every life attached to that arm. So many hopes, so many dreams, so many broken dreams, so many shattered hopes. But more than that, these are people who recognize their need for you and they want you to forgive them, they want you to receive them, they want you to change them. Do that, we pray. And give them now the strength, Lord, to say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to do something. I've never actually done it this way before, but if you raise your hand, in a moment we're all going to take communion. But if you raise your hand, I want you to take your little communion cup that you have, so you have it, take your stuff with you. I want you to get up from where you are seated. I'd like you to walk the nearest aisle and come stand up here facing me. When you're all up here together, I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer to receive Christ, and then we're all going to take communion together. So if you raise your hand, I want you just to come. We're not doing this to embarrass you. Let's all stand up and make room for them. Make it easy for them. Just stand right up here. Come on. God bless you. Come on up, all the way up. You're among friends and family here. We don't do this to embarrass people. We do this to encourage people. We're clapping for the work of God in your heart. We're saying, you're making the right choice. That's what all the applause is. You're making the right choice. This is the most important choice you could ever make in your life. Because in a thousand years, in 10,000 years, you'll be somewhere. And in 10,000 years, it won't matter who won the Super Bowl. It won't matter if you made it through college. What will matter is the decision you're making right now. That will matter forever. Most important decision ever. Anyone else, anyone else, come now. Come right now. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. We're here for you. And God brought you here not by accident. He brought you here on purpose. And this is the purpose. Who else? Who else? Come on. Come on, now's the time. Don't let another week pass or another opportunity pass. Seize the moment. Seize the moment. Make the decision to say yes to Jesus Christ once and for all. Take Him at His word. Awesome. Awesome. Come on. Come on up. Come on up. Yeah, just stand right here. I'm getting my communion ready. Now, before we do this, you who have come forward, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask you to say this prayer. Say it out loud after me. Say these words from your heart to God. You're not talking to me. 
It's not a formula. You're just talking to God. And so mean this. As you say these words to him, say, Lord, I give you my life. I admit I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. And I believe he rose again. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as my Lord. Help me in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Now, everybody in this room, including you, we can take these elements in a whole new manner. Because what you just did is what you are now going to indicate by these elements. So let's take out the bread. Let's get that ready. And under, underneath is a little foil that you can peel up for the... Uh, juice the fruit of the vine thank you lord for what jesus did for us this is a good friday it's a great friday and it's really awesome for these that we have seen say yes to jesus change their lives make them new and father thank you for being our substitute taking upon yourself the holy and righteous wrath of god so that we could have heaven and enjoy eternal life, not because of anything we've done, but because everything he has done for us. And so we believe by faith in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take it together. Awesome. My brothers and sisters, God bless you. Now, since you're here, since you came all this way up front, I'd like you to follow Matt and the team. Come on over this way. Let's go. We want to give you guys something. Just spend a moment with you. Come on over here. And we just saw in this place. Hey, don't go anywhere. Don't leave just yet. Hey, if you're watching online and you just said that prayer, you just said yes to Jesus. We're so excited for the decision you just made as well. And we would love to follow up with you. You can uh, text the word LIFE, L-I-F-E, to 505 505- 509-5433 and we'll follow up with you on there as well. Hey, but for those of us who are here, it's not just a good Friday as Pastor Skip said, it's a great Friday. And it is great because our sin has been washed white as snow by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're going to close in a song now. We're going to sing a song, a song of celebration. Because Good Friday, in this song, it says, Friday's disappointment was Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? So let's sing this song, looking ahead and looking forward to Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can't wait to see you at 7.30 a.m. at Lobo Stadium and at 9 and 11. But right now, let's get ready to rattle some bones and let's sing praise loud and proud as we thank Jesus for his sacrifice. Come on. Put our hands together. Let's stump our feet in anticipation of what God is going to do in the room tonight. Well, Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. Since when has impossible ever stops you? And Friday's disappointment. The sun is empty too Since when has impossible ever starts you This is the sound of dry bones rattling And this is the praise make a dead man walk again Open the grave, I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again Oh, this is the sound of dry bones rattling
bitter cost of fire is stirring something new You're not gonna run out of miracles anytime Come on and shout it out
Sunday, for Easter Sunday at the stadium. Have a great night.